Good afternoon and welcome to the episode for this afternoon's webinar. We are going to start shortly. Yes, dear friends, the webinar will be starting shortly. We got a good crowd. Yeah. Mm. Yes, uh, people are streaming in now. Okay. We got a good crowd. Well, I think it's 401 now. Let's, I'll kick the ball off then I'll start to get started. Hello and welcome back to Bar Chats and Viral Rights. My name is Q Jia Yao from the Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee. This webinar is part of a five episode series that aims to promote curiosity and healthy discussion about our right to be involved in the protection and the management of our environment. This project is designed and carried out not just by volunteers from our committee at the bar, but by a group of Malaysians with very diverse backgrounds. So you could say it's a project by Malaysians for Malaysians. So this series is not your usual legal seminar where experts talk about specialist topics or the latest developments in the legal field. Instead, it is a series where exceptional human beings sit down together and share their knowledge and experience on environmental justice with lay Malaysians. In our five episode series, we are now at our fourth episode. Three weeks ago, we started off with episode zero, our prelude episode, which was a discussion of how we ordinary folks can direct our frustration and perhaps sense of helplessness from cases like Sungai Kim Kim and Sungai Gong towards something more constructive. And then in episode one, we looked at where our environmental rights come from and what are they. In episode two, we looked at how our laws help us protect and manage our environment. Continuing from there, we are now ready to start with episode three, Who Said It Is Easy? Upholding Environmental Justice. Our moderator for this episode is Diva Lingam. Diva has 23 years of legal practice experience and counting. She's a solid public interest lawyer focusing on environmental issues, rights of indigenous peoples, and consumer rights. Diva is a legal advisor to Sabat Alam Malaysia, also known as Friends of the Earth Malaysia, and Consumers Association of Penang. She's also a, a member of the Environmental Law Alliance worldwide. We are very privileged to have uh, Diva as a member of our Environment and Climate Change Committee. And I'll have the pleasure of joining Diva as her co-moderator today. Now, before we start, I would like to mention two things. Firstly, the thoughts and opinions of our panelists are personal and do not represent the organization that they are with. These webinars are meant to get people to ask more questions, better questions, rather than provide specific answers. So don't take anything mentioned here as legal advice for your specific question. Secondly, we would love to hear from you. So please share your thoughts and questions with us via the Q&A function for those on Zoom. For the folks joining us through Facebook Live, post them in a comments section. Our social media tags are hashtag barchats, and viral rights and BCECCC. With that, I would like to invite Diva onto the virtual stage. Thank you very much, Jayao. Good afternoon and welcome to this, to this webinar aptly titled, Who Said in Upholding Environmental Justice is Easy? Now in the, in the previous three episodes, we repeatedly heard that we all have the right to a clean and healthy environment. So this means that each of us, irrespective of who we are or where we live and what we do, uh, benefit from the protection accorded to us from environmental harm. So this pandemic has actually taught us many lessons. One of it being while we were locked in our homes for a few months during the movement control order, we witnessed the healing and rejuvenation of areas that were degraded as a result of human touch. So in many of these places, we saw or heard of drains with clear water flowing. We could smell crisp and clean air, and we saw the return of wildlife. And we know that uh, nature left untouched, she, she heals herself. 
Now, with this in mind, today we will explore the term that many of us have heard of before, but may be wondering what is it exactly? Environmental justice. Now, it's a very big word, but it can be broken down very, very simply. Um, that is why we have the panelists here with us to help us understand what this terms, the term means and why is it important uh, that we, meaning you and I, uh, uphold environmental justice and what are some of the challenges we face in upholding it and how we can manage our expectations and find ways to overcome them. So let's get to know a little bit about our panelists today. Jaya? You're mute. So, so sorry, this is such a new mistake. Uh, fourth episode and uh, I'm still committing this. I have the privilege of introducing Ms. Minakshi Rahman, uh, our, uh, one of our panelists. Right from the start of her legal career, Minakshi was practicing at a um, public interest law firm and represented local communities in public interest litigation on mainly environmental cases, right? And um, not many people are in Mina's league if you look at the breadth and depth of her experience, right? She started her legal practice um, in 1983 and she's been involved in major environmental cases like the Asian rare earth case, that's, that's the one way before the Linus case, uh, the Bakun Dam case and the Raub gold mine case. She was one of the pioneers who in 1989 set up the network of environmental lawyers around the world called Environmental Lawyers Alliance Worldwide or ELAW. It's a network that provides environmental activism that supports environmental activism using law as a tool. Mina was previously the chair of Friends of the Earth International, an international environmental justice organization with 72 member groups around the world. There are many more notable things on Mina's CV, but I'll wrap up by mentioning that Mina is also a climate change expert and an advisor to the Third World Network, and she's currently the president of Sabah Alam Malaysia. Thanks, Diva. Diva. Yep, and today we also have with us Dr. Siva, Dr. Siva Nandan T. Algupile. Hi, Dr. Siva. Hello. It's lovely to meet you. First time I'm meeting you today, actually. Yes. <laughs> So Dr. Siva got his degree, his first degree from USM, and then he went on to obtain his master's in wildlife management and his PhD in natural resource management, specifically focusing on protected area, uh, protected areas policy development. And he has served in the Department of Wildlife and Nat uh, National Parks, Perilitan, for the last 33 years until his retirement in 2015, after holding various positions, including head of Tiger Management Unit, and the director of uh, Perilitan Keda, among others. Um, he was directly involved in the enforcement of the wildlife laws and assisted the Aegis Chambers in the drafting of the Wildlife Conservation Act in uh, 2010. Dr. Siva has also worked with uh, land use planners and engineers in the development of ecological corridors linking fragmented forests and assisted the government in the negotiation and management of several external funded projects for tiger and protected area conservation. Now, since his retirement, Dr. Siva has worked with agencies of the federal and state governments on environment and wildlife related issues. Welcome, Dr. Siva. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Mr. Jules Rahman Ong with us. Jules is a freelance journalist and filmmaker. He has a special interest in reporting on marginalized communities such as refugees, the stateless and indigenous peoples. Jules has investigated on illegal plastic recyclers and the influx of foreign plastic waste in Malaysia and reported on deforestation and the struggle of ordinary people against environmental destruction. His first film, Alice Lives Here, which documents the struggle of Broga residents against the proposed largest incinerator in Asia, won him the best human rights film at the 2005 Freedom Film Fest. His work and co-productions have been shown on Al Jazeera, BBC, Channel News Asia, PBS NewsHour, and many other international broadcasters. Jules is a co-founder of Rainbow of Love, School for Refugee Children, and the Facebook group Fighting for Our Forest, and Bumi Kasi Permaculture. Underpinning Jules's prolific output is a degree in biology and a master's in social anthropology. All right. All right, we have three seasoned activists here. 
uh, to share your thoughts on environmental justice. So let's kick off this webinar with the first part of it, where we want to know more about environmental justice. So Mina, this is especially for you. Can you let us know and define it in, in, for a lay person, what exactly is environmental justice? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much to the Bar uh, Committee, Environmental and Climate Change Committee. I'm so glad that the Bar Council is spearheading this. Um, and thank you to all the viewers who are watching this episode right now, when everybody is glued to the TV or the other people are not watching this, um, to the United States uh, presidency and the outcome. And that has massive implications for us. And that also has an environmental justice component. Because as you know, if Trump gets re-elected, uh, the, the whole world is doomed because he denies climate change. And uh, you know, all of us are out to be burned or to be stung or drowned. And that is as dramatic as that. So it's really going to be very sad if um, Trump wins. Now, this is to get you excited. Please don't go and watch that TV. Uh, but if you have questions later, I can talk about that, about the implications of the US presidency and the rest of the world. Um, what is environmental justice? Well, any, all of us consume um, water. We consume fresh air. If it's not fresh, of course, it's dirty air. Um, everything that we consume comes from nature. Now, this is something that's not realized. The way we consume, the way we dump, the way we throw our garbage, everything has an environmental impact. So environmental justice is basically to ensure that our rights to a clean and healthy environment is protected, that we see ourselves as a part of nature. We are not apart from nature. Everything that we do has a consequence. And so therefore, we have rights in terms of decision making, taking part in development planning, on how the environment decisions will affect us, whether it's building a pollute a factory next to your house, uh, you know, a road which is, goes through a highway with massive noise just going through your housing estate, or if it's an oil palm plantation which is going to displace indigenous peoples, or the mining of radioactive waste which is going to cause pollution to the people for generations to come. So that's environmental justice in terms of us claiming the rights uh, to protection. So I, I, I can go on, but I'll stop there. But Mina, maybe uh, just an invitation to you for you to go on a little bit. Um, why is it important? Why is it important? As I said, um, for a long time, people have, at least the development thinkers, always think of development first, environment later. But I think the chickens have come home to roost in the sense that, we, like the Sungai Gong, like the Sungai Kim Kim, the, the pollution has been going on for years. And then what you see is when you, when you come to the problem, like when the school kids suddenly faint because you know, they breathe in some volatile compounds or whatever, it's, then they realize, my God, the source of that pollution came from some river somewhere. So it's sometimes too late for people before you actually are aware of the problem. But I think there's enough environmental awareness and also climate, the climate change issue has caught on for a lot of us and particularly the young people around the world. You must have heard of Fridays for Future, the young people who are demonstrating and so on, um, so trying to fight for their, the, their generation in terms of saving the world. So it's, it's really a whole gamut of, um, of, of, of impacts that we are now facing for a very irresponsible and uh, maldevelopment that has been taking on, not just in Malaysia, but the whole world over. So we have been over-consuming, particularly in the Earth Summit in 1992. Many of you were not born then. Some of us were children of Rio. The Earth Summit was really a watershed conference. Many, many international treaties were born. The point about how we have to actually uh, rein in um, maldevelopment, how we have to stop unsustainable consumption patterns and production systems, how we need to transform them so that you can actually have a very healthy planet. And so that the rich actually cut back on their overconsumption where you have enough resources for the, poor, for the poor as well. So this famous line about live simply so that others can simply live because we don't have enough resources for this entire planet. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, yeah, I think 
uh, uh, on from Fridays for Future, you know, how um, a, a layperson, in fact, in, this, in that case, uh, school-going children who are concerned, um, uh, taking action and, and uh, being part of that, that narrative about what development means, what, 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 should, uh, what decency means. Um, Jules, maybe you could uh, share with us some of the challenges that um, you know, a layperson would face in assessing environmental justice, you know, where he or she wants to use his or her right to a clean and healthy environment. Yeah. Um, maybe you can share something from, from that angle. You're on mute, like I was. Uh, unmute my audio. Okay. All right. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to this panel. Um, I think before we can even talk about uh, accessing environmental justice, um, it's the information, you know. Uh, so then there's, um, is there enough information that you know where to go? Uh, if let's say, you know, you're sniffing something in the air, the air smells like burning plastics, you know. So maybe in this age of internet, you'd say that there's no excuse that uh, you cannot find the information. Uh, anyway, that's true, but um, a lay person may not know where to find, you know, or how to start. Uh, so maybe you go to the Department of Environment and there's a number and you call and then uh, uh, you call 10 times and nobody picks up. And when somebody picks up finally, you're put on a wild goose chase. Um, and, uh, and then you start to, uh, they say, okay, you can fill up this form, you fill up this form, you put, uh, you put it online and then you wait and nothing happens. And then you start to write letters um, and you go to your Adun, uh, you go to your MP uh, and then still nothing happens. And uh, then you decided to organize a community. Uh, so there's just uh, a lot of uh, trial and error, a lot of learning uh, because um, it's not just, it's not straightforward. It's not so simple that you can access environmental justice. Um, that's one on information. Uh, number two, let's say if an officer comes and checks your complaint. Um, I'm just taking this example from Sungai Patani because they're facing uh, air pollution from plastic uh, recycling factories and they have been fighting this for two, three years. You know? So then the officers come and to check the air and it's hard to get the evidence because the pollution is in, is in the air. You can smell it at certain times of the day and night. And when the officers come, they come at 3 p.m. when the smell is not there. So then there's another challenge. You know? So um, the other, I think the other challenge for Malaysians as lay people is also fear. I think we, sh we have been sort of brought up that we shouldn't complain. We should just accept it uh, or we will be arrested calling for questioning, or we are so uh, busy struggling to make a living, you know, to raise our families that we don't have time or we're tired to go for the meetings. Uh, so we end up with like, you know, few people always in the forefront fighting the cause. You can always know their faces. And in a way, because there are so few of them, they are targeted, <laughs> they are easily targeted by uh, people who don't want them to complain. Uh, so that's the other challenge. Um, and uh, finally, fear too, I think perhaps you may have heard like, okay, there are rumors that this is a royalty project. And so there's no point in fighting. You know? So these things also uh, is something, uh, it's, a, it's a block and it's something that stops you from accessing environmental justice. And uh, so this, this is a disempowering or disabling environment or non-responsive and non-committal uh, government that's not hearing your complaints uh, because it is not uh, in the political interests uh, and, uh, you know, a whole lot of other issues that uh, although we may have laws for it, that you're, you find that you're unable to access it. Thanks, Jules. So we heard access to information is problematic. We also heard about gathering of evidence, how difficult it is. We also heard the uh, heard the issue about fear. A lot of people fear bringing up these issues uh, either because they think that maybe um, they're not going to get anything out of it. That's one. Second thing is that, um, is that you don't want to, they don't want to be a target, targeted by, uh, targeted by anyone. So they also fear for their lives or 
we, we also call them um, environmental human rights defenders and who, who actually worry for, for, their own, for their own lives as well. So moving on from some of these challenges, uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Siva about um, what are the other challenges that we have? Because we heard about access to information and maybe this is also linked to, for example, the environmental impact assessment and other development planning. Uh, why is it the EIA, uh, for example, is, is toothless? And what, okay. before that, maybe before that, just to quickly um, give a quick explanation of what is, an, what is the EIA for? Okay, uh, thank you for, before that, I would like to thank the Bar Council and Environmental Committee for giving me the opportunity. I think this is the first time participating in this kind of seminar. Usually it's all related to wildlife <laughs> issues. So uh, it's an eye opener too. Uh, well, yeah, AA in the sense that uh, I would like to talk about also environmental justice uh, in addition to the, I mean, to the people, to the rural people and all people of, uh, know, who are what's it, affected by these environmental issues. Uh, one of the, another section of the environment that also affected is wildlife. As you know that Malaysia is one of the hotspots for wildlife, one of the countries with high biodiversity richness. So a lot of wildlife are, are impacted and many of the species are, in, some have gone extinct and some in the verge of extinction. So uh, it's much interrelated too, I would say. And, uh, and why uh, EIA, I would say, is an important piece of legislation that came in the mid-70s where uh, environmental issues were given, uh, uh, what's that, uh, prominence. No? Prior to that, it is going to, the agencies have to deal with it. Like the wildlife, I was with the wildlife department and they had to, they had no choice, they had no other avenues because projects were being developed and the department was not in a position to mitigate. So with the EIA process, uh, number the department was able to mitigate a lot of the uh, wildlife issues, especially uh, on the on the mega wildlife, uh, elephants, tigers, and so on, because they need a lot of space to roam around. And the EIA gave an opportunity where you could mitigate these uh, what's that, these uh, issues, and then remedial steps taken. Uh, I would. Maybe uh, Minakshi would know because uh, at some of you might not remember that in the late 70s and early 80s, one of the issues that was uh, uh, issues at that time was the the dam across the Thambling River, which was proposed and uh, supposed to flood around uh, 30 square kilometers of lowland forest, and uh, there were the uh, what's that Batik community orang Asli living there. So the department and a lot of researchers undertook a lot of studies and uh, brought it up to the government and the department managed to bring it up. And fortunately, DOE and wildlife have always been in the same agency. So a lot of things got to be integrated before it becomes a big issue. But there are some issues that, that couldn't be you know, uh, dealt with. You know? So uh, that was one of the, the demos which eventually what's said uh, called off. Uh, in 1983, and uh, Tamangara was spared, spared from the damages. But on the other hand, the Kenya Dam also went through an EIA process. So, but there we couldn't stop the dam. But um, that was the first time where the affected elephants were mitigated, and there was a rescue operation which was funded by the proponent of the project. So that's when I think the department also enhanced its capacity to rescue non-elephants and other wildlife too. So I would say the EIA probably perceived to be toothless, but it also helped in many ways to assist in mitigating wildlife issues. And one of the recent issue was that a major highway was being, was proposed, uh, kind of east-west highway, but in the middle of the central part of the country. And it was going very close to the park 
and we had to mitigate through the EIA process to show that it's an important uh, corridor for wildlife. And as a result, we managed to get uh, three underpasses built at that uh, highway. And uh, it was before the, even the central forest pine process took place. So EIA is very is an important piece of uh, legislation. But nevertheless, it only, we only are mitigating at the project level. So, you, so that is kind of a bit too late. And that's when I think the, a lot of agencies, the Department of Wildlife thought, why don't we try to mitigate it, why to mainstream it at a higher level? So that you know, the land use level and so on. So Malaysia has tried a number of things, but it's still a challenging, challenging issue till today. I would stop at that. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Siva. Maybe Mina, if you can, uh, if you can explain a little bit more about uh, who has this responsibility? Sorry, well, sorry. Who yeah. has in relation, sorry, in relation to the EIA, just a little bit more on the challenges itself. Just a little bit. Yeah. No, well, I agree with Dr. Siva in saying that. I don't think it's entirely toothless. I think it's one of the few processes which actually involve um, public. And uh, as we all know, just to give you an example, one of the positive uses was the uh, Penang Hill uh, which was a major, a theme, a major horrible, monstrous project was coming up on Penang Hill, which was going to destroy the water catchments of Penang. Um, and the citizens of Penang actually stood up. And this was actually through the EIA process. And at that time, we had a wonderful director general who was responding to the NGOs. We had, um, it, was the, it was the largest ever where children even wrote to the Department of Environment to say, stop. The, uh, we don't we reject the project on the grounds of the massive environmental impacts and what was exciting about that was that the the director general was actually very concerned uh, because we had pointed out all the all the problems and the flaws in the EIA so that was a very good outcome but after that of course the states have gotten very worried that they didn't want the EIA to be a tool to be used to suppress their projects so you always have, who's, when you talk about responsibility, whose responsibility? I think uh, what Dr. Siva was saying was absolutely right. I mean, we all have the national physical plan. We have what's called um, in the plans itself, you know, areas being declared as environmentally sensitive. You know, they call it as uh, the, the, what do you call it? The environmental sensitive class one, where you can't have any development. And we all know how, and it, that is translated to even the structure plans and the local plans of the state. And yet today, like the Ululangat Forest Reserve that Devar and I and others are involved with, you have the state government, although it's an environmentally sensitive area, class one, no-go zone, yet they want to de it and want to turn it into mixed development. Uh, this, in spite of the fact that it's a, it's a very important peatland forest, uh, carbon emissions would be humongous if it, we allowed that to go. Indigenous peoples live there, a very important biodiversity, endemic species in that area. You can't find it anywhere else, stuff that Dr. Siva is, is talking about. And yet this is about to go. So whose responsibility? I think it's really a lot of the time we have to put blame on the decision makers. The politicians in particular, um, who is behind this? I think we have to ask these questions. Who is proposing? So you can have the best, um, you know, national physical plan, structure plan, local plan, and yet they are tossed out the window. And the government of Malaysia, the federal government, even, uh, you know, is a signatory to the Convention on Biological Diversity international obligation to protect these sensitive areas. You come home and you actually have policies on that. And it is tossed out the window. And then you go to climate convention. You know, there you, you commit to reducing greenhouse gases. And here you don't have implementation. You destroy forests and you convert so simply. So who is responsible? I think there is, a, there is not enough political will actually um, to protect the environment. And uh, of course, now we see the, what we are facing from the, the dis water disruption. Water is absolutely critical. It's like the new gold. And we can't take it for granted anymore. Our rivers have, have been polluted. Our water catchments, forests are disappearing. So can you imagine commercial activities coming to a complete standstill 
without water. We, the, the people in Klein Valley faced it, but that is a bit too late. In it. But we hope that these examples would actually uh, begin to, to make sure that the political and the, the decision makers take this into account that you cannot take the environment for granted anymore. Environment and natural resources is front and center. It's not about sacrificing for the sake of economic development. This country, we are able to move on a sustainable development pathway. Let's really translate that into real meaning because for long it's just a cliche, sustainable development. Nobody really understands what the hell that is. So you can have the sustainable development goals and you can talk and talk and talk, but at the practical level, that's not happening. So finally, responsibility, politicians will not act if citizens don't wake up. It's okay. our responsibility. And they all need to feel the heat. Thanks, Meena. Also, on the, on the point of responsibility, we are going to move on from who, who is responsible to who has the responsibility in terms of, uh, uh, in terms when it comes to us, regular people. And uh, we, we, because in, in previous episode, in episode zero, we heard about uh, Sungai Kim Kim, we heard about Sungai Gong and the multiple parties involved in a single pollution case. So now, for example, Jules, this is for you. Is it easy for a lay person to know which parties are involved or, and who she or he can, can, should hold uh, accountable? What do you think? Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to know. Uh, but uh, Malaysians, whenever we have a problem, first thing we like to go to our YB. Even if it's uh, our longkang <laughs> tersembat, our drain is clogged. We go to the YB to ask. So at that one, we should go to the municipal council, you know, to get them, push them to do the job. Uh, but for the case of Sungai Kim Kim and Sungai Gong, they're huge. I mean, these are major pollution. And I think people do know, like, who, who to report to, uh, who's the parties that should be held accountable or actually should act on it, you know. They go to the Department of <clears throat> Environment. Or maybe they go to the Department of Irrigation and Drainage. Or is it the National Water Services Commission spread? So it is still quite confusing. Um, and uh, um, I think as a media person, uh, if I were to advise a lay person, you go to the media first and, and get it blown up. And then you will know who is responsible. You know, one by one, they will start to come up. And now in the age of social media, uh, people just put the nice visual, you know, video, you know, let's talk in front of it, put on a YouTube and a Facebook, it gets viral. Then things start to move. The agencies involved will start to respond and to kick into action. Uh, so now we have this extra tool uh, with, that we didn't used to have, uh, the power of the social media. Right. On, uh, Dr. Siva, I would like to then pose this one to you uh, on in terms of... Uh, this confusion, uh, again, the difficulty of uh, identifying uh, who is responsible for what um, and having, asking better questions and knowing where to direct these questions. Um, on the issue of cross-boundary environmental issues, uh, such as deforestation in one state um, affecting the water source of another state, um, um, maybe in this context, uh, some of these challenges of identifying uh, responsibility. Sure. Uh, that's, yeah, as you know that uh, in Malaysia, I think uh, we all kind of uh, being uh, reminded of this again and again, land and forest are all the state matter. So sometimes one state don't talk to the another state, but there is a coordinating responsibility on the part of the federal government too. So they have these federal mechanisms in the form of the national land council and uh, various other councils, you know, where things can be coordinated. But uh, you would see that, as what uh, Minashi earlier mentioned, that we have these plans, the land use plans. We have mainstreamed these uh, water catchment areas, uh, all these conservation areas into the National Physical Plan, then it goes down to various sectoral plans, like the Central Forest Pine, then to the state level, and even to the district level. You know, we have the structure plans. But uh, again, again, we, uh, I was in the, in the department too. We also face that the states, although they have a lot of powers over lands, in fact, absolute powers in terms of land use, 
but uh, they don't have uh, sufficient powers to generate revenue, except to utilize this land and the forest to generate funds. So this is where the, the, the implementation of these plans uh, kind of break down. And uh, the issues are like cross uh, boundary uh, pol pollution issues crops up. I mean, good case is the Ulumuda, because I was a state director in Kedah, and uh, my prede predecessors way back into the colonial era has been proposing Ulumuda as a protected area since 1932. Just imagine until now, it's not really gazetted. Mm -hmm. And one of the main issue which I face with the state escos and all that, who is going to pay us, the state, for us to forego all these, uh, what's that, revenues, you know? Because uh, in terms of conservation, it's, it's for the next generation. So there's a Malay saying, it's sampai what, bulan dan matahari. So when the state says it's for the next generation, the future generation, that means there's no way for them to take it back. Once it's gazetted as a conservation area, there's no way to take it back unless there is a compensatory a physical transfer mechanism that is placed until now we are finding it difficult but i think in 2019 there was an uh, attempt by the, the the previous government to give some kind of fiscal transfer but it was on a pilot basis but hopefully some kind of fiscal transfer takes place to this to the states whereby the states which has have to bear the responsibility of conserving the areas water catchment, river reserves, and so on, will be able to do so without hampering, uh, what's, that, uh, uh, what's that, exploiting those uh, reserves. I mean, the states have a big responsibility, I would say. Thank and you. the federal has a responsibility in kind of compensating to the states. Thanks, thanks a lot, Dr. Siva. I'm going to just take one question right now that has come up on the chat. Um, someone has asked here, Mr. Louise Van Bell has actually asked, how bad is the impact of corruption on environmental issue? I know this is a huge thing, but if uh, one of you would like to answer it and maybe just to keep it very short, <laughs> although I know this could be a session of its own. So either, any, any one of you. Well, since, since I think we are actually going to handle it. No, Siva, you live to come in soon with the answer <laughs> And 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 his, his, and the likes. No, because Louis Van Burl is a good friend from Penang. He's a Penang lawyer, so I'm glad he asked that question. I think he knows the answer himself. Um, environment is actually when you translate it, as Siva says, if it's about timber, it's about uh, projects, it's about mining, it's about resources. Um, so the so how is it connected to corruption? Well, we don't have evidence. You know, that's one of the most untransparent. Uh, aspects that we don't know but a lot of the times there's a lot of public perception that there are big vested interests behind these projects in terms of whether it's a timber concession or whether it's a conversion of a forest to something else um, you know so it's usually associated with some vested interest or other so it's very really important for the public uh, the, the, the public sector the government officials to come clean on this and the decision makers to really come clean and be transparent about this. So I, all I'm saying is I don't, it's very difficult for us to say this was because of corruption, but I am sure that uh, the, the, as we would say, the, the tendency for perceiving that these projects have got huge vested interests and corporations behind them and the close nexus to business and politics um, is very much there. Of course, in Sarawak, there's been so much expose about, um, you know, the timber corporations and the people behind them. So another session, the bar committee can can organize. And in fact, you do need, you should call uh, the, what do you call it? The Malaysian Corruption Agency. That will be really good, actually. Thanks. Thanks, Mina. So be, uh, along along the lines now that we are speaking about this, maybe, maybe it's good that we move on to the next one. Whose right is right? We're looking at the competing and com conflicting goals between the different stakeholders. For example, the corporations, they have a duty to ensure that their industries do not impact the environment or the impact should be minimal and they have to operate within a sustainable manner. Now, the main aim of many of these companies, I mean, if we see, the main aim is to make profit. And sometimes environmental compliance uh, 
could be very very expensive now this is uh, this is a question to jules uh, how how do you think a balance can be struck i think um, corporations main goal is profit and they are answerable to the shareholders based on that and they want the investment in dollars and cents to grow and other things are secondary uh, so they have to be made to have that balance because on their own it's profit making so uh, if consumers are informed and aware and want to see change then we can choose to not put our money in those companies uh, that are damaging the environment and to put our money into companies that are more responsible uh, of course it's also easier said than done so there has to be a lot of you know uh, environmental education awareness on it uh, but just to give an example that these uh, consumer choices can change trends is uh, smoking. Uh, smoking is a health, health issue, but uh, I think 40, 50 years ago, smoking was very acceptable. I think almost half of adult population smoke. You know, we used to have ashtrays in the cinema, in our cars, you know, but now we cannot even smoke in a mamak shop anymore. Um, and in the States, in the 60s, 40% of the adult population were regular smokers, now only 13%. So that's also part of uh, more information coming out from the uh, medical side that uh, smoking is very damaging, it causes cancer. And so uh, consumers have become more aware. And so you see the trends change. You know? So there is power actually in what you choose to buy and don't buy. And I'm just going to give an example. Um, this year, the Institute for Business Value, or IBM, they polled 19,000 consumers from 28 countries, including Southeast Asia, and they found that uh, consumers are increasingly embracing social causes and shopping for purpose-driven rather than value. Uh, nearly six in 10 consumers are willing to change their shopping habits to reduce environmental impact. Nearly eight in 10 said that sustainability is important and they are willing to pay 35% uh, more uh, for the brands that are sustainable and environmentally responsible. So this is a good trend. I guess the only problem is, will this be fast enough you know, uh, to change uh, before you know, we, we kill off all the species and cause climate change? change. Um, and just one more uh, point is that uh, corporations must be made to pay for the pollution. The, the fines, uh, the fines that we have is laughable. You know, like hundred thousand ringgit, and uh, yearly turnover is in the millions. So corporations must be made to pay for the pollution, the contamination that they have done, uh, and if they do not comply, uh, you know, it has to be severe. You know, it, it can be included in the tax in a form of the work needs to be done to clear up pollution. For example, plastic, plastic bottles, plastic packaging. Um, in Germany, um, uh, governments can actually lead in that so that corporations and companies can follow. Uh, 13 years ago, I think Germany imposed this uh, where uh, if you bring back your disposable beer cans and beer bottles, you'll be paid 25 euro cents. And that used to happen when I was growing up. We bring back our Fanta bottle and we're given 5 cents, 10 cents, you know. So in the beginning, uh, the companies and the retailers fought this scheme, you know. They said that that's not going to work. But there's beer bottles and cans were polluting the environment. But now, after years of it being in force, Germany has one of the highest rate of recycling. In fact, 98 to 99% recycling rate for return non-recycler cans and bottles. So uh, this is an example of a government-led uh, policy that can uh, help to push corporations to find that balance if they're not able to find it themselves. Right. Thanks, Jules. Um, on the, still on the theme of um, conflicting goals between our stakeholders, Dr. Siva, um, maybe from your background uh, in the civil service, like different government agencies also have differing goals and aims. So what should be the balance factor here? How should it be? Yeah, my working experience, we've been always dealing with it. Uh, basically, uh, in, uh, take a forest. Uh, we have a forestry department and the Department of Wildlife and National Parks. Not say we are fighting over it, but we have different goals. One is uh, sustainable use of the forest. The other one is trying for conservation. Of course, sustainable use brings revenue to the state. 
and uh, conservation, you have to wait down the line, maybe 10 years, you can see some kind of uh, returns from uh, tourism or ecotourism and so on. Or it's intangible, where we don't pay for it, for the oxygen and for the, you know, carbon dioxide that's being secreted. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, whenever we propose to the state governments a particular area to be conserved, the land is actually is not on a vacuum. Somebody is managing it. Forest department is managing it as a forest reserve. Then you want to convert it into a conservation area for the conservation of wildlife and so on. So, of course, there is a kind of a, what you call that, a vertical tension no? between uh, the agencies and so on. Uh, interest. So, I would see that if we can uh, take the land which has got so many interests in it, the land has got uh, logging interests, mining interests, water use component of the land, even the timber or logging I mentioned earlier, and uh, recreation, even to build a dwelling. If we can compromise on some of these interests, where we could uh, forego some of the rights over the land, you know, and then compensate for the loss of the rights. I think competing agencies can work together. Not only competing agencies, competing parties, developers and conservationists can work together. It has been tried. Maybe uh, later I will try, kind of uh, elaborate about there is time. So we have to identify these rights. What land, so the states have certain rights, the federal government has certain rights over a particular piece of land. And of course, if you, when we say protected areas, wildlife reserves, national parks, and so on, when you go to the state, they just look at it as land, you know, because the land is, gives them a lot of uh, empowerment uh, under the land laws, you know, land code and so on. So if we can, uh, for each of these rights, we can kind of compensate for the landowners or the owners of this to forego the rights, then I think we can reduce the conflicts among the tensions among these uh, interest groups. Thanks a lot, Dr. Suga. That's, that's, uh, that's a good way of uh, moving forward, actually. So now we, we move on to the next part where we want to speak about the complexities and the challenges. The, and we're looking at it from, a, from the legal remedy route. We're not looking at anything else. The non-legal -re remedy part would probably be spoken more in the next episode. But here we want to speak about um, the challenges that we, that we face. I mean, a lot of us would face in relation to standing to sue or locus standi. And we have heard this in the previous episodes as well. Um, in episode zero, also in episode one, we heard about uh, locus standi. Now, Mina, why is, is the standing to sue a complexity? And what is, why is this a challenge to environmental justice? Yeah, I, I think it's a yeah, it's an important issue because the courts have been so you know divided over this, uh, not just in this country but world over. But uh, there is a tendency now to recognize that we have to liberalize who can bring an action to court. Uh, as Deva said, you know, the next episode we'll talk about the non-legal remedy. But usually we advise that you don't go to court if you haven't exhausted all the other avenues. But of course, we'll come later to that the, the time time frame for that and all that. But uh, the standing to sue, who can bring an action? In most of the times, I think that uh, what, what, well, if you want to challenge a decision of the government at the moment, you can bring an action to challenge that. And um, what all the courts, the courts have now recognized that all you need to show is that you have some kind of genuine interest, that you're not a busybody, uh, you know, somebody who's a stranger, but you have a genuine interest. And that's sufficient. You don't have to show, you know, that you suffered something in, a, you know, privately or whatever. So that that's a good thing. It's a good way to move forward in terms of expanding locus tendi. Um, but I don't know how far our courts will go. For instance, if we have an NGO taking an action on behalf of protecting a forest or something, you know, because nature can't speak for itself. In some jurisdictions, they do actually. They've, they've actually expanded it to the extent that that somebody speaks for the rights of nature. The fact that the elephant or the, you know, they can't come to court, right? I would love to bring an elephant to court so that it could <laughs> yes. so, Yeah, right, Siva? Yeah. So that people can see. But, uh, you know, the, the point is this, that, you know, that I think is some time to go, but I think we do need to test it. So all I'd say is that 
it's it's a bit more liberal than before. Um, but if you are suffering, you know, from a nuisance, a pollution, a noise, a, a factory, and you are affected, I mean, that you really, I mean, that's it, beyond just uh, genuine interest. You are actually privately affected. So that gives a rise that is actionable for uh, what that means that you can actually go to court and stop um, the pollution or the nuisance from happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, Mina has brought up uh, bringing an elephant to the court. I think that's uh, it, it's it's no um, laughing matter because it is actually a, a point that is being uh, actively pursued in the U.S. Um, with the non-human rights project, where they are arguing for uh, legal personhood for uh, animals, um, and then therefore and through that to grant them locus standi. Uh, so that their stories uh, can also be heard uh, in, in, in a forum and adjudicated upon in this uh, struggle between conflicting interests. So um, maybe, Tiva, we can talk about the uh, cost of uh, the cost aspect um, as, as we move forward. Yeah. So on the cost itself, um, bringing, an, uh, bringing an environmental case to court, most of the time, you know, we hear that it, it's very expensive. So what about this cost? Very expensive uh, or when you want to file a suit in, in Malaysia, I mean, how expensive it, is it? I, I, I am actually quite reluctant to answer that question because then tomorrow everybody will say, you know, Mina said this is the amount, you know, and they'll go and say, Bar Council, please take disciplinary action against this lawyer because Mina Rahman advised that, you know, despite what, you, yeah, yeah, you know, you all are saying, you know, don't, this is not, this isn't, we, we're not um, imposing anything here. But I, it really varies. I don't think there's any standard. So you can have, uh, somebody was asking about pro bono. You can have people who are doing this in the public interest, which is pro bono, which means they don't charge their legal fees. There have been a handful of lawyers who do that, including in the Bar Council, I think, where you have senior lawyers doing this for matters for free. But of course, there are court fees involved where you have to file documents and this, that, and the other. But that's actually the first stage of it. The, the other aspect of the cost will actually be if you have a pollution case or like in the case of the Asian rare earth where we had the Bukit Mera, this is a community which fought this huge company, Mitsubishi Chemicals of Japan. You have to bring scientists and that is actually a much bigger stumbling block in terms of a barrier to accessing environmental justice because the burden of proof is still on the person who asserts that your right has been violated. So you have to come and prove why, you know, radiation is hazardous. What is the level of radiation in the community or in the Rauf gold mine cases, Deva knows, you know, why were the children falling sick or the people smelling some awful odor? And this is not like a smoking gun, you know, where you smoke a gun, you shoot somebody, the gun smokes, you know, it's a causation. This whole issue of causation, cause and effect. How do you know that we are the, the, the particular company is responsible for what it is, like, like the Sumai Gong and the Sumai Kim Kim? So many put rubbish into the river. How do you blame one company? So it's actually a huge battle. So for this, and our, our just, just to make it very short, and we are even facing this as many, current, many of our current cases now, fishermen challenging a huge massive reclamation project in Penang, having to prove that, you know, this reclamation is going to affect their income and the way the fish moves, the marine lives in move and so on. Courts don't, don't entertain you, you with logic. Huh? I mean, the courts will say, where's the proof? But you'll say, no, no, it's happening. Yeah, but where's your scientific evidence, right? So, so then you need to look for the, the scientists. And usually, Malaysians, Malaysian scientists are very, very reluctant. If you are a Malaysian scientist listening to this webinar, I would appeal to you to be a bit more progressive and join the Bar Council Committee to help us. So we have to go, you know, that's why we formed the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide. In the Bukit Mera community case, we had to seek lawyers, I mean, scientists from overseas. And these scientists were public interest scientists. They had to be brought in. They were good people who we had to prove. So it's not enough to get a lawyer. So on the expense side, it really depends. And whether you bring it to the Sessions Court or the High Court or the Court of Appeal, it can go on. Yeah? So and Mina, lot, that's yeah. the element of... Uh costs when you lose. Yes, uh, coming to that as well. Courts also, I think we have a duty to educate our judges, really. 
I mean, if you look at the sentences, you know, when the one question was, you know, could be why, uh, you know, you, you, you charge, you take a culprit to court, like in Penang, we had a landslide and people, workers died. And you know what the fine was? 30,000 ringgit, 40,000 ringgit. I mean, as, as someone said, as Jules said, these guys make money in the millions. What is this pity, pitiful fine? Yeah, put them in jail, put them into, take them and put them. You know that Sungai Gong, when the company, you know, the, the what do you call it, they were paraded with um, handcuffs on the front pages of the media. Now that began to send, send shivers. We have to begin to see these as environmental crimes. They are not just some private violations. They are an environmental crime. So just to say that I, we can't give you any ballpark figures. You can pick up the phone and call Deva and call the Bar Council Committee. They can guide you. But I'm not going to name anything. But there have been cases where the judges have said this is a public interest litigation. So therefore, no order is to cost. No cost will be imposed because this is a public interest litigation. So I think uh, that, that that's, that's important because these companies, that's the final point I will make, they will bring the, you know, top-notch lawyers paying them millions of dollars, scientists who will testify on their behalf, even though it's bunkum. And we have faced a lot of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so there, are, there are barriers, but I think that this is not to discourage people. I think it, we have to fight. Otherwise, yeah. you won't get your right at all. Yeah. So, so Jules, do you reckon uh, bringing environmental cases in Malaysia is only for those who are financially capable? Um, I think money is a big part of con consideration, uh, whether you can bring a case to court or not, but I think it, it shouldn't be the limiting factor. I think uh, communities can uh, do a lot. They can uh, collect money, crowdfund for the cause. And in these times of social media, uh, if you have a compelling story, you can crowdfund and funds can come not just among the people who are affected, affected communities, but from the outside. Um, and uh, the, the example of the termias and the blockades, uh, the deforestation in Kelantan, um, their lawyers have come to offer pro bono work um, and uh, pick up the cases for the orang aslis. And then uh, I concur with Mina, you know, there are so many other expenses, you know, that there's not just the court litigation uh, fees, you know. So uh, I see that ordinary people and NGOs are coming to collect money to support the Orang Asli, to collect evidence uh, in order to claim the native uh, customary territories, you know. And, and there are a lot of costs to it. It's like things that you don't know. You're like, uh, for the Orang Asli, just to gather the evidence, they have to ride their motorcycles uh, through the forest, you know, so that they can meet their elders, uh, so that they can get the histories from the elders, you know what this limestone cave meant, this tree meant, this grave meant, in order to show proof that their community have lived there for generations. Uh, and this is going on. I just spoke to Mustafa, who has been doing this for the past two or three years, this Termia grassroots leader. Uh, and I asked him, what, what help do you need? He said, oh, I think I need some uh, money for my motorcycle and to repair my motorcycle because I need to submit all this evidence to my lawyers who have done this pro bono for me. Uh, by January next year. Uh, these are simple things. And then he has this old laptop and it cracked up and there was months of work in it where he typed down all the histories uh, uh, from the elders, you know, that he interviewed. And then he had to redo. And just last year, they did this map, GPS mapping. We collected money for, it, for them to buy the GPS. They've gone through some training. They can use the GPS and mark their native customary land. They did this huge uh, uh, community map you know, that has the graves, the, the rivers, all that. And then he folded up, he put in a bag, and he rode a motorcycle to come to Kuala Lumpur to give, give it to his lawyers. On the way, there was a storm, there was a rain, and the whole map was wet. That was months of community work. When he arrived to Kuala Lumpur, he cried. You know, I'm like, oh my God, Mustafa, wow. Why, why didn't you tell me? We could have just gone to get you in a car or something, you know. Actually, they don't want to depend on us, you know. But uh, we try to help them because we know they are the frontliners. They are the frontliners who is going to protect our forests, you know, our common forests. 
And I think uh, we have to start thinking that now, that the, the awareness that we share a common environment, the notion of not in my backyard will hopefully be replaced by a wider, broader understanding that we are all interconnected. That whatever happens there can happen here. If there's air pollution there, it can come here. The river is polluted there, it's gonna affect our water. And if you cut the forest in Kelantan, it is going to affect us. And I think more and more people now are, are realizing that, uh, you know, climate change, uh, you know, it can cause floods, you know. So uh, in terms of, uh, we go back to, uh, if you're not financially capable, I think uh, when people know this, they're willing to support you uh, in terms of finances. And more than finances, actually, is the uh, collective awareness that this is happening to all of us and we're all interconnected and we need to help each other. Thanks a lot, uh, Jules. Yeah, that's really very important. I mean, we actually see that... Um, Cost is an issue and it would affect a lot of us if you're thinking about bringing a case to court and the problems that Mustafa had faced here is, is really very relevant to many, many people out there. Uh, I'll just quickly move on uh, that we, uh, to the last part uh, of, the, of today because it's already five o'clock and we're going to just take on maybe a little bit more of your time so if you can be patient and we want to listen to this really very interesting conversation. I know one hour is really not enough. <laughs> probably two hours or three hours to thrash a lot of these issues out. But um, just quickly to talk about um, uh, e education and awareness, do people even know enough um, when, we, when we are talking about environmental laws and rights? Are people generally aware of their rights and have enough channels for, uh, are there enough channels for environmental education? Or is this one of the barriers to environmental justice? So this is an open question. So maybe um, uh, Dr. Siba or Jules or Mina. Yeah, I would like to, I mean, when I was in school, secondary school, biology was a compulsory subject. Right now, biology is not a compulsory subject. Although we have more students in the secondary school, less people are taking biology. Public are getting very ignorant about biology. And you don't, if you don't know biology, how are you going to know about the trees outside your house? As somebody told me when I was in the government service, as you walk out of your house and you cross your drain that is in front of your house, that drain was once a, a stream. Malaysia was full of streams. The housing estate was covered with forest and stream. And when you see a stream anywhere in the urban area, it was a river or a it was a a drain was a stream, but with, with the lack of well, uh, awareness and environmental education, there's not even an environmental education component in schools. Of course, the government tried the Ministry of Education, I mean, the Ministry of, uh, at the time when it was Ministry of Science, Technology, Environment, were advocating this. There were some subjects integrated into geography and so on, environmental clubs formed, but it was not comprehensive enough. So if your society is not environmentally educated, how are we going to, it's a very shallow understanding of uh, environmental issues. So when you go and tell the, some uh, administrators about the Department of Wildlife, and they talk about tiger needs 10,000 uh, hectares of forest to roam, he says he went and saw the zoo, he's only living in uh, less than one hectare. So you, you know that you have a big problem, no? So I don't blame, but sometimes this, we have to fix the system from a very young age. So a very rich, bio-rich bio -rich country, biologically rich country, and ignorant of its species that is found in front of the house. Everything is a tree, everything is a bird, everything is a flower, but what are the name of this species? Do we learn in our schools? Are we taught in our schools? So we have to go to the basics. And from then on, things will pick up. I think it can be fixed. I mean, we have 50% of our country as forest, but there is something going on in the forest. You know, Dorian's coming up, timber left has flown, coming up, but do the public know about it? It's no use, just the authorities know about it. If the public knows about it, then it becomes an agenda in your elections. So environment right now, it's kind of a shallow, it's not deep. It can be white, but it's not deep. He has to, as what uh, uh, 
Jules mentioned that we have to get our citizen, uh, what's that? Uh, I mean, being more aware of this, no? That our country is rich in biological diversity, rich in uh, cultural diversity, and it is interconnected. Cultural diversity and biological diversity is very much interconnected. One culture use particular kind of species, another culture use another particular kind of species. If we are going to standardize, we are going to lose our biological diversity. Thanks, okay. Dr. Siva. Okay, so uh, Mina or Jules, do you want to add a little bit to that? Well, no, I think he has said it and uh, I think it's really spot on. I think it starts at the basics, the education level. But um, also, I do think that it's not just the responsibility of the school system. Um, it's, uh, the you know, the, you've got the use of the media. You've got, I think there's a lot more media coverage now. I think we can use all, all apparatus that environment has to be front and center and environment and climate change. I think uh, we, we, we have to do that, all of us, all of us. So I congratulate the... Bar Council Committee for taking this lead. You didn't start with uh, company law, but you actually focused on environmental rights. So congratulations. Thank you very much, Mina. And just quickly moving on to Jules. Jules, do you have any last words before we say um, our goodbye? <laughs> I think the younger generation, actually, they're more mm. aware of environmental rights because they're born in a time of climate change and species extinction. Um, and I think I don't think they en they're engaging much at the formal channels, such as the agencies, government agencies. And rather, they're taking it again to the social media and organizing mm -hmm. their own protests, you know, to get a message across. Uh, how Im impactful these uh, formal or non-formal mm -hmm. channels? I think depends on the issues, uh, but I think that they can strengthen each other. Um, and the more channels, the better. Uh, and even even if lobbying on a certain channel doesn't directly help to solve the case itself, it can help to bring awareness to the issue and then to help others to learn what to do, uh, that you have a right to speak out on this, uh, to ask for demand for a change. So uh, I think each of us have our responsibility and we, we can choose what channels and uh, what level that we want to do something about it. I think it's also very important to start with oneself how do you lead your life? How, how is your lifestyle? And uh, be the change that you want to be. All right. Thanks so much, Jules. Um, yeah, we are already now at 5.08. And, um, I, you know, we've been taking questions and the questions are still coming in. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe we'll just choose one more question and then we, we need to wrap up. Um, Diva, have you got a question that... Uh, I'm, I'm scrolling through uh, the ones that's come in from uh, on Facebook as well. Um, if, maybe we take one because there's one here from uh, Shanti Lingam, but maybe that could be answered in the next episode. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah so we, we take this one maybe from Farzana Rosaidi, uh, who has asked, do projects conducted in Malaysia, are they required to have consultation sessions with environmentalists to ensure that we can curb any degradation to the environment. Mina, or Dr. Siva, or Jules? Yep. Anyone? Yeah. Actually, I answered in the chat already. No. I supplied the answer. So basically, yes. Uh, the, well, uh, if there is an environmental impact assessment required, then there is consultation. consultation. Um, if it's under the Town and Country Planning Act for planning permission, then there is a process there. Uh, so there are some avenues. Um, so I think we need to educate people more about what those avenues are. I think that's the next step that the Bar Committee can do. What are all the um, procedures and processes that the public can engage with in terms of taking part in environmental decision-making before a project is allowed to go through? Mm, all Thank right. Th Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, it's been very... Uh, uh, savvy as well. Our panelists have been engaging with the uh, audience here. Um, yeah, maybe I want to just close off with one last question um, about, uh, there was a question about the pro bono stigma, right? I think it, mm. it came out about, um, you know, um, there's a sense, there's a sense that uh, lawyers who do uh, cases uh, on environmental justice are expected to do it on a pro bono 
basis uh, and, and should not take money. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts? Um, anyone, I, I, open question. Mina is smiling. <laughs> Well, well, I know I didn't want to dominate, but anyway, since uh, it's about the legal practice and the law, I think the, one of the problems is that the assumption that that lawyers, you know, live on fresh air and sunshine also, or NGOs do the work with no money, we can't. Huh? So there is there is a sense of of uh, there is a there is a need to under to underscore the fact that. You can, there has to be some minimal charge la, so that, you know, your time and your effort and all that that you're going through. So we can't expect pro bono all the time. Um, but I do think that this ties up with what Jules was saying as well. There is crowdfunding, which is possible. You have to have supportive communities. Um, we, we had a case where the community was very poor. They couldn't afford uh, this was this was a prawn, you know, in in, in a prawn, a one thousand hectares of uh, acres of farmland being converted for a tiger prawn farm, and now it has collapsed. But the but the community actually collected, you know, got together and gave a contribution. So if you have large numbers of people affected, and this is through representative action, you can actually bring cases. So that it's not an individual person, but large numbers of people. So every person who contributes a certain amount to the kitty, and then you will enlarge it through. The, the, the support through the NGO and so on, then I think there's a way to actually help the lawyers, help whoever uh, the scientist who's coming on your side, your witnesses and so on, and helps the community come to court, taking a bus, not in the time of COVID, but in all our cases, public interest cases, they take the bus, they come in large communities, they come and stay in the mosque, uh, not hotels, or they come and stay in uh, you know, Chinese assembly or whatever. You know, whatever it takes to show that this is a community fight and not an individual fight. Okay. Thank you very much, Mina. Thank you, Dr. Suga, and thank you, Jules, uh, for coming here and spending time with us today, today evening. Uh, this has been very uh, helpful, very enriching for every one of us. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of you again probably in the next series. But then over to you, Jaya. Yeah, splendid discussions. I wish we had more time. And yes. big, thanks, big thanks to our audience as well uh, out there for tuning in and putting forward very good questions and your comments and thoughts. So please have our apologies. We can't go through all of your uh, uh, questions. I hope you found the episode to be useful and especially how spilled on what you have gained from our earlier discussions in episodes 0, 1, and 2. You can watch the recordings of all our webinars on our Facebook page. Our Facebook handle is at BCECCC. That's BCECCC. Next week, we will be having our final episode of our Bar Chats and Viral Rights series. So mark your diaries. It will be on the 12th of November, Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Uh, having discussed our roles as members of society, what environmental rights are, how they work, and the challenges you could face when exercising your rights, we will complete the discussion with the all-important question. So how? What can we do? We will hear from a few human beings who have been agents of change through various pathways. It will be a valuable session on taking action and making a difference with whatever you have from wherever you are. So you can find updates on this final episode on our Facebook page. And uh, if you found this to be useful, please share with your friends and like and follow us on Facebook as well as Instagram. Until we meet again next week, thank you for participating. Goodbye and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you all. Hey.